My name is Gene Kim, and I've been studying high-performing technology organizations for 25 years. <laughs> that was a journey that started back when I was the CTO and founder of a company called uh, Tripwire in the information security space, uh, where I served as CTO for 13 years. Uh, our goal initially was to study these amazing technology organizations that simultaneously had the best project due date performance and development, the best operational reliability and stability in ops, and they had the best posture of information security and compliance. And so naturally, we want to understand how did those amazing organizations make their good to great transformation so we could understand how other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so as you can imagine, in a 25-year journey, there were many surprises. But by far the biggest surprise was that how it took me into this middle, middle of a movement called DevOps, where the goal was how to get these organizational silos called development and operations to not be adversaries, but instead work together towards common goals. And so over the last 10 years, I had the privilege of leading and uh, co-leading a study that studied over 36,000 respondents over six years. And the goal was to understand, you know, what makes high-performing technology organizations great? And so what we found over six years from 2013 to 2019 uh, was that these organizations deploy capabilities more quickly. Uh, they can get features in front of customers once they're completed in less than a day. Uh, they could do hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of these software deployments every day. Um, and when bad things happen, they could recover in less than an hour versus uh, uh, days or maybe even weeks for these non-low performers. So what we found is that these differences between great organizations and not great organizations were vast, two or three orders of magnitude. Now we found that organ in these organizations, uh, they were twice as likely to organ achieve organizational goals. Uh, they were twice as likely uh, to have organizations, uh, employees recommend their organizations as a great place to work. And so what we found was one of the top predictors of performance was uh, organizational culture and architecture. To what degree can teams work independently of each other without vast amounts of communication, coordination, scheduling, prioritization, uh, or in the worst case, having to deploy together, which uh, would lead to outcomes that were not so great. And so what I've been working on for the last three years is working with Dr. Steven Spear for the MIT Sloan School of Business. And our goal was to understand what is in common uh, between the software world, things like Agile and DevOps, uh, in his world, which was manufacturing and the Toyota production system, and later uh, engine design at Pratt & Whitney and the safety culture at Alcoa. You know, is there uh, something in common? And our conclusion was that they are all incomplete expressions of a far greater whole. And that all of these tactics, these techniques, uh, the goal is to help enable a magic that... Uh, enables organizations to win. Um, and so what I learned working with Dr. Steven Spear was, has certainly been one of the most intellectually challenging experiences of my entire career, but also one of the most rewarding uh, because it, it exposes a simple set of principles that are always at the heart of any organization as they transform from worst to first or you know, not so good to great. Um, and so what does that magic look like? Uh, what I've learned is that in winning organizations across whether software, hardware, across all phases of value creation, is that in winning organizations, they are somehow able to fully liberate everyone's problem solving capabilities, that everyone can uh, work, do their best work easily and well, and achieve the grandest goals of the organization. And I think so many of us we've been exposed to or have friends that have uh, been uh, having to live in organizations that do the exact opposite. Somehow they constrain or fully extinguish everyone's full capabilities. And so what I've learned is that architecture, um, the way the organization is wired, is absolutely at the core of the leader's responsibilities. That uh, really in any organization, we're doing three types of work. At layer one, it's the work in front of us. Uh, as a software person, it could be the code, it could be the artifact running in production that's making our online services run, uh, or it could be at layer two, it's uh, in the technology we use in our code editors and the platforms that we run on. But where leaders should be spending their time is in layer three. It is how organization people in the organization interact with each other. We call it the social circuitry or the organizational wiring. And it is uh, not meant to be figurative. It's meant to be literal. Uh, just like any circuit, whether it's a mechanical circuit or a, a hydraulic circuit, it, we're taking... Uh, something that's an abundance in one place and getting it to where it's needed. And so one of the hallmarks of a 
organization not wired to win is that no one has what they need when they need it. <laughs> and to get it, uh, they have to talk to everyone in the organization. Uh, maybe I have to escalate eight levels in the organization to get what they need. And when they get it, it's not in the right format. <laughs> and uh, it requires a lot of rework and uh, uh, a lot of uh, potentially having to ask for it again. A lot of communication and coordination. And so I love the Winston Churchill quote. Uh, we, he said, uh, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So too is it for the uh, wiring of the organization. Once we shape the wiring of the organization, uh, potentially forever after it shapes us. Uh, one of a friend of mine, he said, I'm in a large telco. And the, one of the top goals of the company is to get a checkbox presented to our tens of millions of customers so they can opt in to a $5 a month service for email or for uh, to watch movies. And uh, the problem is that it's estimated to take $40 million because it has to cross 40 different teams. It requ will require CEO minus one level support, daily warm room meetings, and most troubling, <laughs> Most people will give it a 20% chance of success uh, because the last two times they tried it, uh, it didn't work. And so this is not a technically challenging problem. It is at layer one and layer two. It should be simple to solve. The problem here is entirely in layer three. Somehow no one, no one in the organization can do their work easily and well and get what they need to. So one of my favorite, uh, in fact, so I'm going to share with you the three mechanisms that we identify that are at the heart of any transformation. Uh, one is called uh, slowification. So the worst time to uh, solve challenging problems is uh, during is in production when, uh, especially when there's high consequence, when you can't undo, when small mistakes ripple out and cause vast problems. So we want to shift work from the production environment into safer environments, into planning and practice. And so the second uh, mechanism is simplification. And so here we change the nature of problems so they are simpler to solve. And so we can uh, do this by uh, chopping the problems into smaller pieces. And then the third mechanism is amplification, where we want to be able to take the even the weakest signals of failure and amplify them so they can be decisively acted upon so we can better detect and correct, and even better yet, prevent it from happening again in the future. So in this book uh, that has been so rewarding to uh, work on with Steve, we have over 20 case studies of examples from not only the software, but manufacturing, uh, airline emergencies, the space program. But one of my favorite um, examples is about two people trying to move a couch. Let's call them Steve and Gene. And so you might think that uh, moving a couch is all brawn work uh, with no brain work allowed. And yet it requires Steve and Gene to solve many challenging problems. For example, they have to figure out where is the center of gravity uh, around which axis do they, need, they do need to rotate in order to get through a narrow doorway. In order to get through a narrowly uh, dark set of uh, stairs, uh, who goes first and does that person face forwards or backwards? And what's remarkable is they don't need uh, focus groups or consultants just by picking up the couch by through trial and error, fast feedback, experimentation, and most importantly, communication and coordination. Uh, we can have confidence that Steve and Gene will be able to figure out how to achieve the goal. And the big lesson for me is that there are all these things that we can do as leaders that can make it far more difficult for Steve to Gene to achieve the goal. We can turn off all the lights, uh, which uh, makes the work more dangerous. It will take more time. <laughs> they may damage the furniture or worse yet themselves. Uh, but we can also uh, introduce a lot of background noise, like you know, turn on a loud siren or uh, you know, turn on loud music. And this is a different set of challenges for Steve and Gene because they can no longer communicate and coordinate. In fact, we can put in an intermediary who will prevent Steve and Gene from talking directly with each other. And suddenly, if we can put in, uh, we might require them to go through work orders, uh, account managers, or even have lawyers present. And under these conditions, uh, it may become impossible for Steve and Gene to uh, achieve the goal of moving that couch. And so this is what happened in the DevOps movement. Uh, we had developers and operations uh, where we had project managers uh, intermediate their coordination, and suddenly they, we could not ship software easily and well. And so my big learning from uh, working with Steve is that uh, a, a simple metaphor like a couch 
can explain so much about whether we are creating management systems that enable greatness, that allow organizations to win, or preordain uh, our organizations to make uh, work not easy, not well, but miserable uh, organizations to work in that create miserable outcomes to our customers. And so, so I would leave you as well as one piece of advice is uh, when you are trying to see people work together, the couch is a metaphor for joint cognition, joint problem solving. Uh, are we creating a condition where we have thousands of people all coupled to one couch, where everyone has to communicate and coordinate and synchronize to even get the smallest things done? Uh, right, and the lesson there is uh, is to chop up that couch into smaller pieces so we can regain independence of action. Or uh, are we actually trying to move a couch and we've accidentally turned them into a bunch of chairs? <laughs> it is the best thing to do to glue them back together again so that it can regain cohesion so that people can have everything they need at hand so they can do their work easily and well. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. And uh, the book is called Wiring the Winning Organization. And I hope this gives you some insights into how organizations are wired to either win or not win. Thank you.